I just walk through the world trying to understand the things that are happening. And I look at things and I it's just hard for me to then just accept well, the things are the way the things are. I, I I see things and I must ask, why is that happening? And so when it comes to deep learning, now I see how the field works. I see I see the movements happening. And I'm like, okay, why is this happening? Hello. Today I chat with Conrad Cording, who is a professor of kind of computational neuroscience. He's at the intersection of brains and AI and kind of causality. And we chat about the history of the field of deep learning. And, you know, especially thinking about these new LLMs that are spreading today, GPT-4 now and all these other ones, it's kind of scary and intense. Um, and, and so we kind of take a step back and, and Conrad talks about what it was like to code these things 20 years ago, you know, as he was coding these neural networks and how he had to code the, the specific learning rules and all this. And then we came up with this idea of a loss function or gradient descent where you're like, you know what? Instead of Conrad coding the rules, instead you let the AI kind of learn them by being like, hey, here's kind of your network. Here's like the loss function. Here's like the goal or whatever. You learn kind of the, 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 the learning rules. And so from that lens, we then kind of go through the history of AI, especially going from this brilliant kind of biological evolution perspective that Conrad has written about. And, you know, we talk about this idea of deconstraints. You know, that's kind of the second big piece of the podcast. And deconstraints are a way to understand how biological evolution worked, where we started to create these instead of making sure that everything was like kind of um, connected to each other, we instead said, look, we're just going to make a deconstraint here so that if the heart gets bigger, the body gets bigger and vice versa. Um, and, and you know, instead of the brain needing to be, uh, instead of needing to have a perfect body for any environment, we're just going to make a brain that can learn whatever environment. And so these were examples of deconstraints um, in biology. And you can see similar deconstraints happening now with uh, machine learning, where we are taking all of the kind of possible constraint space or whatever. And we're saying, look, we're just going to delegate that to the kind of learning process instead of pre-defining everything up front. And so we go through a couple of examples there of how these different systems are, we're kind of allowing the AI itself to kind of, um, to kind of automate a lot of the learning process. And what that's doing is that then is then speeding up the process of, of um, progress in, in machine learning. And so we chat about that, and then finally we chat about the, the state of current LLMs and, you know, why Conrad is feeling kind of existential about um, are humans like LLMs? Are we just, how, how, how are we different from them? What's the difference between knowledge and intelligence and all of that? So it's, it's a good exploration into the evolution of machine learning as a field and what will continue to propagate it forward in the next kind of years and decades. So with that, um, we've had a lot of great folks on recently. So don't forget to, you know, like and subscribe and, you know, give us a rating on your podcast app. Um, yeah, we really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy doing this and trying to bring these amazing um, insights from people who are really at the frontier of things and trying to share them uh, with you all. So thanks so much for listening and goodbye. Hello, Reese's Pieces. I'm Reese, the co-founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. I believe the best way to predict the future is to build it. And so I'm interviewing pioneers on the frontier to understand what the world will look like and the secrets behind how they're building it. These are insights from the frontier. And today I'm excited to chat with Conrad Cording. Conrad is a German neuroscience professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the co-founder of Neuromatch and is also researching at the intersection of brains, AI, and causality. Conrad, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Luis. We're excited to dive in. And Conrad has amazing blue hair and I'm bald, so I don't have blue hair. Um, and um, and it's funny because as Conrad and I were chatting before too, his last name is pronounced it's a umlaut and and i was trying to say kudding but but conrad that that's wrong could you say it for us well i i pronounce it as kudding kudding okay 
But I have long gotten used to the way Americans pronounce my name. That's why I no longer even tell most people that I technically have two dots on my O and therefore it is cording instead of cording. Yeah, yeah. Well, today I'll probably just keep it to cording for my simple, simple little brain. Um, and so for, you know, for the listeners and for you and for me to all understand, the kind of goal of this conversation is to really to dive into kind of your your own brain. Uh, you have this amazing intersection of interests around neuroscience and computational neuroscience and also artificial intelligence and like how things happen in the world. And so, and you wrote this amazing piece called Nothing Makes Sense in Deep Learning Except in the Light of Evolution. And we'll dive into that as well. And so before before getting into all of that um, in the intersection of, you know, machine learning and brains, could you tell us, tell us, Conrad, like, how did you find yourself into these random little rabbit holes? Like, how did you get curious about the world in this way? Uh, I I don't know. I mean, like, I I just walk through the world trying to understand the things that are happening, and I look at things, and I it's just hard for me to then just accept. Well, the things are the way the things are. I I, I see things. And I must ask, why is that happening? And so when it comes to deep learning, now I see how the field works. I see, I see the movements happening. And I'm like, okay, why is this happening? And I read papers and I have certain thoughts about the papers. I'm like, why is that happening? And, and, I, and I think that that's what drives me into these rabbit holes. That this way, if you look at my body of research, you know, most people, they're really known for like that one thing that they're really good at. Whereas for me, it's really, I move from one area to another, trying to kind of make a patchwork that allows me to understand what's happening around me. Cool. Yeah. And it's a, I love that, like asking why over and over and kind of it reminds me of a Carl Friston ism, which is he's just like, look, I'm just trying to understand the 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 fundamental nature of reality in the simplest way possible, you know? <laughs> and so when you look at things, you're like, what is happening here? What is happening here? So let's kind of, yeah. um, let me actually ask you another question there, which is, so did you start with neuroscience and then became computational neuroscience and then became AI -y? or how did you kind of were you, or did you start AI and then get to brains like well, how did you kind of navigate that it, it it's a weird trajectory you know, like I first started studying physics then Classic. about a year into physics I realized that really molecular biology is the most interesting thing a little down the road I find that molecules are most interesting when they're in brains. A little later, the physicists decide that I'm really a heretic and therefore shouldn't be doing what I should be doing. So I, I basically came to them. I told them, here's this way of thinking about the development of like young brains based on molecular gradient. And it is all the relevant things are like really solving these couple of differential equation systems that ultimately give you a brain, not like it, it's, it's, it's this thing, a tube that falls and then like that sends accents into the right direction and so forth. All that is like really couple differential equation systems. So it's something that the physicists should like, but the physicists didn't know that they should like it. And I didn't manage to convince them. So ultimately I had to leave Heidelberg where I was studying physics, where I was quite happy because basically they wouldn't let me be this person that I was, that I'm still today. And like, I see things, I see interesting things there and I want to have the permission to kind of ask questions there. They didn't. So then I went to Zurich where I did computational neuroscience. So, for the rest of my undergraduate degree. And then as part of that, I kind of developed an interest in what you'd call machine learning now, which didn't feel like machine learning back then. It was simulating neurons, but I was simulating neurons as little neural networks that I were trying to do things on real world tasks. And then I went afterwards, I went to London where I was interacting with the people at Gatsby. Jeff Hinton was there at that time. Uh, a lot of wonderful machine learning people like Zubin Garamani were there, uh, Peter Dayan. And then I went to um, 
to Josh Tenbaum at MIT, who and always was working on language at that point of time. And then eventually I became a movement science focused professor at Northwestern, and now I'm a very, very unfocused professor at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I love it. It's um, and that's it's funny because yeah, I don't really the people who I have on my show are never the people who are like, look, I was a physics PhD and then I did that the whole time and then I became a professor and I still have my little like niche. It's like no, 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 no. These are the people who can't be contained. You know, they're like, and and um, I'm reminded of thinking of someone like you know Nick Lane, this um biochemist who's you know at the intersection of biology and chemistry, and he's like, and the the chemistry folks never or the, they don't ask they only ask how they don't ask why you know and so like trying to That's ask right. why is good. So I'm, I'm glad you've done the the good work of um rejecting what the the the, the rail society has given you and, and been a, been a crazy man. So <laughs> so tell me about um let's talk about the you know I want to get into the state of machine learning and um you know, in the state of LLMs today and GPT-4 and all of that. Um, and you and I were chatting before and, and the show about a little bit, just like, yeah, it's kind of, um, there's a little bit of anxiety in the air around the intensity and the speed that these things are moving. Um, but before doing that, yeah. I guess I just want to ask you for like, how, you know, if you think about your, and I think it, this shows in this, in the, the piece you wrote about, you know, machine learning and, and evolution, tracking the machine learning field over time, how have you been, what has been your kind of um, orientation towards it? And how have you seen it shift over the last kind of two decades? Yeah, so let's let's maybe start at the beginning. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was into building models of brains. Kind of back then, machine learning and neuroscience, that was very close to one another. So at NeurIPS, that was basically a bunch of neuroscientists hanging out with a bunch of machine learning people asking how intelligence could work. So, so, so this felt like it was very close to one another. And let me tell you about like the early project. So back then I was simulating neurons. And of course, as soon as you simulate neurons, you're like, okay, how could I make them learn? The way the field was usually building these things is you, you write a little simulation of what neurons do, and then you write like a learning rule like of how the properties of those neurons change, and then you let it run and see if it does something interesting. It was a complete nightmare because most of the time you write this learning rule and it doesn't do anything meaningful. It just explodes or it it it, it vanishes or everything vanishes. It's there's so many failure modes of that. And it was only partway through my PhD, in fact, most way of the way through my PhD, that I started thinking about neurons in terms of let there be a loss function that is being optimized by the system. And let's assume that we have like a gradient like thing that like optimizes it. Once I did that transition, my network start, stopped failing. Basically before that, if you write a network and you write a learning rule, most of the time this thing will just do nothing useful at all. But once you have gradients, then it at least gets this thing right. Now, that thing might not be what you want it to do. Like, like I've been struggling with the alignment problem since like 2000 or something. Um, but, but, you, but, but back then, very, very simple networks by today's standards would always fail in lots of different ways. Today, my undergraduates can kind of build models that are so complicated that I would have had no chance of building it back then. And that's kind of like this thing, the big why question behind this paper with Atom that we'll be talking about today, which is like, why was I so incredibly incompetent at building networks in 2000? And why is it so easy for my students to build them now? And that kind of led me down a certain rabbit hole. Yeah, I love that. Well, Conrad, I'm I'm sorry to tell you, but it's because you were dumb and your students are smart. You know, no, 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 <laughs> that, no, no, but like that's that's of that's of course part of the explanation. 
<laughs> yeah, it's um, but you know, I love what you say, which is it's it's also just so I'm I'm 31, and so I I wasn't there at the time of writing all these learning rules, and so hearing you talk about that is just such a good reminder for myself for the young listeners. Where it's like back in the day, yeah, everybody was like hard coding in these things and saying maybe this learning rule works, maybe this learning rule works, and then what we do today is instead we say no, go you you Mr. AI you or Mrs. AI you go learn the thing, and we're just going to allow you. Eventually, we'll get a compiled code that will then have these learning rules built into it, but you're going to learn them, not me. So, so tell us about, let's kind of, kind of dive into this paper now. Um, again, it's called Nothing Makes Sense in Deep Learning Except in the Light of Evolution. And as, as a side note for you and for listeners, yeah, I, I started to look into this because I'm trying to understand, I'm writing this big history book on what patterns want, which looks at genes making the tree of life and then memes making the tree of ideas. Um, and then these new kind of new replicator, these like, you know, computer memes, these keems, whatever you want right. to call them making this new tree of algorithms or whatever you want to call it. And so I was trying to understand this intersection of biology and machine learning. And a bunch of people pointed me towards this paper, which was very, very excellent. So <laughs> tell us about what what's going on in this paper and why does nothing in deep learning make sense except in the light of evolution? Okay, so so let's first maybe start with the original. Now there's a paper that says nothing in bio, uh, biology makes sense uh, apart from in the light of evolution. And indeed, if you look at biology, you get so much traction by just considering evolution. Like that starts with the forms forms of beaks of birds, but it it it's it's kind of everywhere that you can say there is this complicated world out there, but it it kind of is in a way like optimizing for the specific niche that animals find themselves in. And, and it's a very rich, very old field of trying to understand the world outside the biology there based on evolutionary principles. So, um, Artem and me, so, so Artem, uh, my co author on that paper, has a, comes from the evolution side. In fact, it's fun how we first got together. I was Artem. It's obvious that evolution does great approximates gradient descent in a way. Can you help me like write this up or like like clarify that set of thoughts? But we drifted into a very different direction where we get into modern evolutionary theory. So the big question that we wanted to 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 understand is back then in 2000 basically it was so painful to do things. Today it's so easy, and we build these massive models with with many many orders of magnitude more parameters than back then. So, how did we get from A to B? Now, how did we get from A to B? Well, Darwin asked that question. Like he he went from island to island and like looked at like the creatures he found, and tried to describe what must have happened in the past. Now. We have something that Darwin never had. We have papers with code. Have, have you ever looked at papers with code, Reese? I have, uh, and it's there. It's a PDF, and then you'll kind of look at it and might have some math, and then it might also have some code in it. This, this and maybe, it'll, maybe it'll link to GitHub as well. Yeah, so so it's this massive repo of like the the, the code of classical papers. So there's a big difference no one has seen these birds when they first started to deviate from one another in Darwin's case. Whereas we all see what happened between AlexNet and today's vision transformers. Not like the whole the whole record is there. The whole geological all fossilized. Record. Exactly. Exactly. It's all fossilized. Okay, so then the question is kind of what's happening. And then we looked at the principles in modern evolutionary biology and ask, can they help us understand the deep learning field? And here's a concept that is so obvious, but that I like kind of never realized, which is constraints. So if we are in biology and we have a set of constraints, maybe you have your body and you have your heart. If your body's very big and your heart's very small, then you can't run properly, you die. If your heart's very big and your body's very small, then your heart burns all the energy and you die. So what, then, what that means is if we're in such a situation where you have a constraint, like your body size needs to be right-sized for your heart and vice versa, 
evolution will be slow because yeah, I can make your body a little bigger and it's going to be fine. You're like kind of a little low on blood, but that's going to be fine. And same thing for the heart, but, but basically any big change will lead to basically a child that's born dead or like that, that will very quickly fail in the evolutionary tree. And so constraints make evolution slow because it basically means it can't tinker because like stuff falls apart. So the idea now is there's this concept called a deconstraint. If I have something that has a set of constraints, can I reformulate it so that the constraint goes away? For example, um, we can have a developmental program that says, if you're low on blood, make your heart smaller. If you're like really well uh, supplied with blood, make your heart smaller. And so the idea now is that we basically replace a constraint that we have that makes evolution like slow and ineffective with a developmental program or even just with a way of recoding things that makes that problem go away and that allows you to tinker more. Now, let's use the constraints of like deconstraints and developmental programs to tell the history of deep learning. Oh, good, good luck, good luck. <laughs> Okay, so in the beginning, <laughs> there was... Uh, God made the earth and made deep learning, the deep first deep learning paper, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. No, but like in the beginning, people would write, uh, would produce networks and they would produce learning rules. And if things were lucky, then the learning rule would match the network and it would work. In most cases, it didn't work. So the vast majority of like babies, if you want, were dead on arrival because basically the learning rule exploded or went to zero, like all kinds of other bad things happened with it. Then came great, so there's a constraint. There's a constraint between the learning rule and the network that we have. Therefore, if you tinker with one, you also have to tinker with the other or everything goes down the drain. Then came gradient descent. It wasn't technically that sequential. No, the first forms of gradient descent were in the 70s, were earlier than that. Like this, you can you can see the trace of like gradient descent like things go like all the way back into much earlier times. But but at some point of time, we realized how powerful that gradient descent idea was. Why is it so powerful? I just tell you what my network is and what my loss function is. And there you have your learning rule. There's no more like this whole like magic. They don't, there's no longer a constraint. It's basically you do that. Now, that if you want the advent of gradient descent is a fast deconstraint. Now, you can say there was still a constraint, which is, um, it should be an easy constraint. It wasn't, which is, there is like the learning, uh, there, there is the network and the loss function, and then there's the learning rule. Oh. Now, the learning rule, or gradient descent, back then, we would by hand build our calculations of gradients. Now, it turns out that if you do gradient calculations by hand, at least that's me. Look, look, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not very competent at those things because if I implement it, there's always a factor two that's wrong somewhere or a minus that shouldn't be there. Like there's these little mistakes that I make in implementation. Then we get autograd. It, it takes away this constraint where I need to correctly implement the gradient. <laughs> no, you, no one comes concerned about that. Like, Autograd solves it for you. But back then, that was like it still needed to be done, and it's a remarkable how often that can go wrong. Now, let's look at more modern things. And like we figured out at some point of time that if we want to if we want to change the size of our uh, of our batches, we want to scale the learning rule with it because otherwise kind of we change things. And so we are using a constant for that ratio. It again takes out a constraint. Otherwise, I change the batch size. I need to change the learning size, uh, learning rate. I forget one, and like then everything goes goes badly. So, 
uh, we, we figured out all these constraints that are in the things that we are building. And then if you look at the modern things, so we're all using hyperparameter optimizers. Think of what a hyperparameter optimizer is. It's a developmental program. Now, you don't specify the parameters anymore. You specify the program that makes the parameters, which is like within that range, figure out the things and kind of like locally find a minimum that allows me to characterize that. So, so, so in that sense, we, we, we are massively moving things from pre-specification into, uh, into developmental deconstraints. Yeah. So it, out of that, you kind of get like a description of what's been going on that comes from that perspective. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And just to kind of um, pull that back off the stack for the listeners, it's like um, there's a that in biology, you have all of these developmental deconstraints that are, as you said, it's like uh, that we have our, um, that yeah, as, as we're kind of building ourselves, we kind of say, we kind of delegate stuff to the like, um, kind of like the embryonic prog you know, process, or it's like, look, we're not really sure what this thing will look like, but let's like kind of couple them to each other so that when the snake comes out, it doesn't, it's like, it's, it's legs aren't crazy or whatever. It's like, okay, it's going to look fine. Um, and so then that allowed us then to say, great, now we have all these bilateral symmetry, you know, um, entities out there in the world do all these crazy things. And, and the reason why we had that Cambrian explosion is because, um, the, 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 we had a deconstraint, um, instead of just saying, oh, we need to make sure that the genes specify every specific thing. It's like no, let the let the kind of um, developmental process, the embryonic process, kind of learn that. Um, and similarly, what you're saying is for um, artificial intelligence that we've kind of, you know, we've we've uh, in, a, in a way like automated, you know, instead of predefining all these things, it's like no, we've kind of automated a lot of the parts of of these processes. And I, I think of it as there's a great. Have you read Andre Carpathy's um, Software 2.0 piece, by the way? Oh yeah, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And it's a, it's a beautiful piece about how back in the day we would take, um, uh, we would code up programs ourselves in C++. And instead what we do now is we say, Hey, no computer, you go do the thing. And then, and then we're going to compile it into a program that does the right thing. And so we've kind of, that's another version of a deconstruction. We're just like, look, we don't want to do it. You determine what the code should look like. And then we'll run the code. Is that, is, do you agree with that mapping or? It, it's yeah. And it's a very similar point that Andre is making there. Yeah. And, and so um, how do you, like a question I would ask, or go, go. I, I, I was, I was just going to ask, uh, to, to, to add the difference in, in ways of looking at our history. Now, like there's one way of thinking about the deep learning, which is the engineering way, which is we progressively understand how large high dimensional computing systems work. And we like engineer our ways in the same way as we engineer bridges. And there's truth to that way of thinking about it. But there's another way of thinking about it. it was, if we're honest, how do, you, how do we write our papers? What we usually do is we start with a model that someone else published before and we download the code and we, we, we decide where we want our innovations to be. And that might be a little block somewhere in our code. We're like, I think we can be more principled about this case. And then we make it better this way. Sometimes we write a paper where we're basically, look, there's this, there's, there's this transformer that we use for uh, maybe uh, NLP tasks. And then there's like these convnets that we use for vision. Can we kind of like combine those two ideas into a new idea? So there, there is therefore also this level where it's almost like, like our papers are like a genome where we, we take previous papers and we take ideas from there and we like change a relatively small number of ideas and that idea space is where evolution happens there. And these two views, the engineering versus the evolution view, they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but it matters in which of these domains we primarily are. Because if we're in that first engineering things, it's almost like our history doesn't matter. Whereas if we're in the second one, it's like we want to look at for the things that were successful, kind of what that manifold is, where they happen, and use that to build deconstraints to kind of make these stumbling blocks that we have go out of our way. Yeah, I love that. Exactly. It's like, it's a, and it, yeah, it's, it's why everything only makes sense in light of evolution, because we have to track the history of, oh, why, how did this thing come into being? Why, it's that why question, and why, oh, this happened because this researcher was looking at this other thing. And so, and, and, and so tell me about one specific one that I want to ask about here is, because I know this was in your piece, but I didn't totally understand. It's like, 
could you talk about something because transformers if you think about gradient descent as like a crucial bit of like instead of writing all your learning rules just like let the thing learn the learning rules through gradient descent um now transformers seem like the neck i mean there's a bunch of big things that have happened but like transformers are really big how are transformers an example of um this kind of deconstraint process are they yeah i mean like there was a time pre-transformers where training I mean, it's still a problem how to scale up really, really big transformer networks. But there was a time where it was exceptionally difficult to write pa uh, write parallel systems that require tra uh, uh, transmitting information between graphics cards. Um, the architecture of transformers makes that considerably easier to scale. And I think this is one of the reasons why Transformers took off the way they did. That basically, at first, there's constraints about the flow of information within the system that we have. By kind of minimizing that amount of necessary flow, kind of writing Transformers is, or scaling Transformers is much easier than it was pre-Transformers. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like, and I'm thinking, and, and you might have to like, uh, guide, ha, hold my hand a little bit here, but I think that there's a, you know, when I think about these, like, um, the recurrent neural networks, which were ways of looking through text and you're like, okay, I need to and understand blah, blah, blah. I'm looking at the next thing, Reese and is it a him or is it a her? And then I look backwards and I'm like, oh, it's Conrad. I think you're a him. Okay. Reese and him, but you have to keep all this context in your memory and all this stuff. And, and so now what we can do is the transformer like knows which it kind of points at the places in the past, um, like a heat map kind of like where, um, you know, where, where it should look in order to determine um, what this next uh, token should be or whatever. Is that, so, so tell me, is that, is that the crucial, or how does that, and how does that relate to the parallel processing bit? Tell me a little bit more about how parallel, how transformers are an example of a deconstraint. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, let me see how to best. Um, yeah, so it was a while ago that I wrote it. Um, You're good. So, so it, you, you locally, the transformer locally looks at a bunch of tokens. Um, it doesn't look at all tokens. And therefore, the update that you make after using the transformer is in a good way localized. So therefore, what I do on a given transformer, I can relatively readily change. Now, if on the other hand, I have an RNN that runs through things, I the, the update that I need to make is much less localized. And I believe that that's one of the things that contribute to the scaling advantages. Um, that's great. You know, that's, that's the exact kind of thing that I was looking for is like that there's a, it's these localized updates that allow for parallelization um, instead of everything needing to be kind of sequentially learned at once, which then doesn't allow for the GPU massive scale parallelizable processes that, um, that we have. So that's, and I just wanted to like double click on that for a second um, as a way to kind of view transformers as a, as a thing that allows for faster learning, that allows for faster deconstraintizing, that for faster all of that. Um, so yeah, so thank you for the double double click there. Uh, go. Yeah, no, like like that that's that's a, that's at least my interpretation. So people have done some analyses where you say take a confnet and see if you can make it be competitive with modern transformers, and if you properly do tune it you can make it competitive it's just harder yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like the the yeah the the, the recurrent the convolutional or the uh, the the re re recurrent the co is this confit when i hear confnet i i hear convolutional neural network but i'm thinking in my mind that it's a recurrent neural network but what is what is confnet sorry oh no no confnet is a convolution neural network. okay great 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 yeah and so it does it does it can work the same but yeah you have to tune it better so tell me about i guess kind of you know, taking a step back and thinking about this de this world of deconstraints, and um, and now we're in this kind of and kind of bring us to our current moment here of like, 
you know, you know, last week or whatever, we got Mid Journey V5, GPT-4, we got um, uh, Cloud, Anthropic Cloud, we got the Microsoft announcement, we got, it, there was a lot, there's the Stanford, you know, Alpaca piece that was, you know, built off of Llama. So tell us, like, you know, is that, you know, I guess, how do you see, and whether it's connected to um, this deconstraint frame or whether it's just um, a more general frame, how are you feeling about the current state of LLMs and, um and what it means for the, like, what will happen uh, in, in the future of, of, of artificial intelligence? Well, I can't see into the future, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but things happen much faster than I had expected. I don't know about you, but I saw the progress in NLP. And I remember maybe two years ago to see kind of these scaling the scaling of compute people were throwing at it in the scaling of size. And I felt it was curious that it was scaling so fast. But I somehow thought it would peter off quickly. And then when when we look at maybe like a year back or something, or things were continuing to scale. If anything, they were accelerating. And all of a sudden, these systems were solving a lot of problems that I felt were probably very hard problems to solve. Um, and that the speed with which this is happening is, is, is worrying me, maybe. But it's almost like it makes me uncertain about how the future looks like. And it makes me a little uncertain about who we are as people. And like, maybe, maybe we are a little LLME. Maybe, maybe there's kind of a lot of our essence in these things. Maybe like, maybe we aren't like even as intelligent as we believe we are. No, like, okay, let's, let's take the other side. No, like, yes, we are, unbelievably more data and compute efficient than any of the LLMs. Yes. But at the same time, it felt there was this such a massive gap between language producing systems and us. It was, I mean, look at text translations from like three years ago or something. That was an embarrassment that it was clear that they weren't even close to what humans could do. And now if you look at modern text translations, they're like, they feel very different. They feel very, very different to me. And yes, I feel kind of existentially threatened a little bit, despite the fact that probably like of all jobs that will be put away, like mine isn't one of the first, but it still feels really disconcerting somehow yeah yeah that um there is something very strange about um and i, I wrote just wrote this piece on how gpt4 is domesticating us and how we're domesticating <laughs> it you know um and so there's a co-domestication process happening and it feels it's just weird to see this new thing emerge. Um, it's almost like COVID emerging. You're like, whoa, there's this like crazy thing that exists out there. But this new thing is something that is is not just a single entity on top of an existing kind of viral substrate. This is like a whole new substrate that can like perform lots of different tests. So, so tell me, I think that you talked about there that I'm, I'm kind of um, curious about is how are we like LLMs? I'm not an LLM. I'm my own man, you know? <laughs> so the way you learn to think... In a way, it's by talking with other people. Like, like if you think about the things that move you emotionally, or like that move you in your ability to think, it's always talking with other people. Or maybe it's listening to podcasts. But it's still the interaction between people that makes us think better. It feels now that language models, they, they have all that information. They have millions of people talking with one another they have all these moments where people also learn but they they have a sheer unlimited number of those so 
in that sense, you can say the way you you think, in large parts, you learn it by talking. But if the way you learn by talking, uh, and LLMs kind of have that talking experience, maybe those two learning experiences are somewhat similar. And maybe a lot of our thought patterns are embodied in the way we talk. In which case, an LLM can use that to compress speech more efficiently. So, 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 so in that sense, it's almost like LLMs get me to rethink what I think about intelligence in myself. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. It's, it makes me think of, uh, there was a, a, a beautiful, I just did a podcast with Kevin Kelly recently, and he wrote this book on like 300 different um, uh, pieces of advice for, for folks. And, and it's kind of, and, and him and I were joking that like, we are, you and I and Kevin and everybody, we're essentially just the, the sum of all of the little kind of mimetic um, concept handles that we have. So it's like, you know, um, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise or whatever. It's like all, we're just like the <laughs> full sum of all of those little snippets and that, um, and so we are those. And so we exist as those. And then LLMs are these things that have all of those snippets as well. And then that they're kind of like being able to snippetize and have both the thoughts and the externalized versions of the thoughts, the kind of actions or, or speaking that kind of represent um, that space of, of the snippet space or whatever. Although they don't have the actions. And I think this is a major thing that is currently missing. Like if I allow you to interfere with the world, if I allow you to reach into my world and change things, you can really find out how things work. Otherwise you can only imitate things. There's a big difference between understanding how things work and just being able to imitate things. And in fact, unless you understand this interface into the world, you can never know how the world works. And therefore, arguably, there's still something fundamentally missing, which is embodiment. And it's arguably an important part of kind of what gives us the skills that we have and, um, and something that just text will never give you. I think that's really important. And I think, yeah, like we'll kind of, the LLMs will always exist as just kind of like chatbots waiting to be poked, you know, or whatever. And they're the hanging out. And then you're like, hey, chatbot, blah, blah, blah. But, but versus a, a human, which goes out there in the world where, and, you know, you know, talking about Frist and stuff, like we change uh, the world to fit our priors and we change our priors to fit the world. Part of the changing the world to fit our priors is like, that's going out in the world and like, you know, doing things and whatever. And so the, you know, we're not, it, creating robots is expensive. Creating things is expensive. Um, and so, do you do you imagine? For me, what I see happening with that is that is that as the robots become, or as the as the LLMs become more embodied in physical robots, that will be part of this. And then also maybe as the LLMs start to use create like LLM human complexes where they use us to do um, physical embodiment things, and then we pr we give them back the data of like what's happening. I feel like those are the, where this goes. Or how do, how do you see like the physical embodiment um, evolving in the next couple of years? Yeah, there's no doubt. No, people are building better and better robots. And clearly, you'd want to feed LLMs with that kind of information simply because it's just so rich. Basically, figure out what happens as a function of what I do. Because ultimately, the information that I want to have about the world is what happens if I do something. Because what I can decide is what to do, I can't decide anything else. And that information is currently missing. And clearly, to get maximal value out of uh, out of generative models, we want to put it in that situation where we can do things. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's like um, and the the simple form of what happens as a function of what I do, you know. And they have a bunch of that clued into them as for, from learning, you know, these lots and lots of parameters. But then being able to actually do it themselves is is a whole different thing. So I want to ask you as we kind of get into rap mode here. Um, I guess the first question I might ask you is what deconstraint do you see happening? Um, are there, what are the, what are the, what's going to be the hippest deconstraint in the next kind of last year or the next year or two, you know? So, so I think one thing that we should do is analyze the set of successful models and see what the implied constraints there are. I believe we can constructively build that. So I'm thinking about something that takes maybe a network built by me or maybe a network built by Yuri's. And, 
it then takes that network and edits it, basically putting it onto that lower dimensional manifold of things that are probably going to (laughs) work. And basically says, well, you know, with what you do, your learning rate's probably a little too large and level 17 needs more neurons and kind of goes through that and does the relevant edits. And I think that that's one of the deconstraints that we can use in the near future. And uh, also for hyperparameter optimizers, you, know, you can say there should be a meta-meta hyperparameter optimizer that basically says, well, look, we don't need to look through all that. We can basically make that faster by realizing that there are in the space of hyperparameters implied constraints that we currently throw compute at that we don't need to throw compute at. Um, and I think if you look at modern scaling analysis, now where you change the number of the amount of compute and the number of parameters to kind of see how that affects performance, there's a lot in that field already that goes into that direction. Yeah, I love that. I love the um, thing, and you do a great job on the piece about talking about the world, you know, the the cultural evolutionary story of why something happened today and why transformers are important is a, is connected to um, the kind of no free lunch theorem or whatever. Where it's like you don't you have to understand how the world works, and so there's a space of hyperparameters that exist, and so you don't need to you don't need to search it every time. You can just be like, oh, this thing that was successful. Let's just kind of use that something around that search space, probably. So I think that's smart. It also the first thing you said makes me think of um did you see the um stanford alpaca model built on the the llama model did you see that thing that was last week i i i saw that it came out but i don't yet know what what they do and how let me tell you let me tell you let me tell you what it is because i think it's exact kind of deconstraint thing and you can tell me if i'm wrong so roughly what they did is they took a um uh they took a simple um uh what did they do yeah so they took a uh um, they, they did a bunch of um, pr- tasks um, with outputs um, with GPT-3 or GPT-3.5. And they said, hey, look, here's 150 ones. They did like this self-instruct thing where they said, look, we're going to give you this. We're going to get back this. We're going to give you this. We're going to get back this. And then they said, hey, GPT-3 or 3.5, give us um, 50,000 of these things where it's like, if you give me this, you should get back this. And so then we, we got all these um it said, great, here's where we're, we're going to be awesome. We're going to get, here's like roughly what this space should look like is you put in these 50,000 kind of things, you get out these 50,000 kind of things. And then they took that and GPT-3 or 3.5 is, you know, lots of parameters, some amount of billion. And then they went over to the llama, the, you know, Facebook llama, which only had 7 billion parameters and they fine tuned it. And they said, hey, Mr. Llama, Mrs. Llama, we're going to, here's, oh, yeah. rough, we're going to give you these 50K. And then you, what we're going to pull out is these other 50K and like, this is wh- how you should act. So you as a pseudo intelligence should act more intelligence, act like GPT, like this other thing. And then it did. And then it, it looked, it, it looked like a hundred billion parameter model while only being a 7 billion parameter model. And so that to me makes me think of what you just said, which is here's a successful model and here is, um, let's like train the dumber model on the successful model to show it how it should act. Is that, is that how does that land? It's it's a form of distillation in a way, no? I'm, I'm not sure if I'd call that a deconstraint, but there might be a deconstraint in that space where you can say, maybe in the future we always want to like transition between like different models and there might be there there might be some interesting constraints there i haven't thought through it yet but yeah i see what you're saying which is there's something about the deconstraint space which is about automation and that there's there's something uh, that there might be if you always take models and kind of cross-reference them with others like build up intelligences and you you're always doing that then that might be a more of a deconstraint than kind of the um the, the physical kind of like manual process that they did or something yeah or, or you could say but, but this is a different notion of constraint one constraint that we have at the moment is that we need to be able to throw a few million dollars at training a model and if we can instead take someone else's model and cheaply distill it into our model, <laughs> and that puts us into a very different space, no? Uh, less constraints. But those aren't the kinds of constraints that we mean, where you can say there's multiple things that are coupled with one another, which is how we, how we are thinking about the modern biological evolution literature. I love that. Yeah, no, that, thank you for the uh, distilling that, which is that instead of spending $5 million 
on you know GPT-3 or whatever, you can kind of pretend to be it uh, by spending $600 and fine tuning Llama, you know? And that is a money deconstraint versus a developmental one, which is actually like learning how the world works. So, okay, great. As a final note here, um, let me just ask you a couple of these overrated and underrated. Um, so I'll say a thing and you'll tell me whether you think it's overrated or underrated and like one sentence on why. Um, and so the first thing is LLMs. Do you think LLMs are overrated or underrated? They're underrated. I believe as a tool, they will change literally everything we do. Okay. Wow. Um, damn. Um, sweet. Uh, what do you think about the um, kind of people making analogies between neuroscience and machine learning? Is that overrated or underrated? It's underrated uh, because that's what pays my bills. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no. So, so I think... Uh, AI or uh, like machine learning is the cleanest way probably that we have about thinking about brains. The problem is the brains are so big that unless we have theoretical ideas, we have nothing that we can use to really understand brains. Machine learning gives us sets of tools of understanding learning in high dimensional spaces. And that's what we need to make progress in your sense. Love it. Yeah, love it. Um, great. Lots of underrated things, even though there's still there's still a lot of hype around them. But yeah, it's 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 tough for us when we're at the bottom of an exponential to really to really feel the exponent that is coming. Um, so with that, Conrad, thank you so much for the time today. For folks who are listening, A, if you want to check out this paper or just Google, nothing makes sense in deep learning except in the light of evolution. It really um, helped me understand kind of the overlap between the spaces and also gives a better kind of cultural evolution evolutionary um, deconstraint lens on like how what's going to happen with the future of machine learning. Um, so check that out. Also check out um, Conrad on the Twitters. That's at Cording Lab, C-O-R-D-I-N-G-L-A-B at Twitter. Um, and if you're excited any of this stuff, feel free to, if you're doing deconstraint work or auto ML work or any of that, feel free to, to reach out. Or if you're doing cool open science stuff with Neuromatch or any of that, feel free to reach out. Um, Conrad, anything else to say today? Yes, I wanted to briefly say that all the good ideas of what I talk about today go back to Artem Katznachev, who's my wonderful co-author on the paper. And all the bad ideas are my misinterpretation of what he said. Love it. Yeah, no, I, I do love that. It's funny because yeah, as I was looking at he he got rid of it recently, so I was sad. But if you want to check out Artem, um, it's uh, A-R-T-E-M and then uh, K-A-Z. N A T C H E E V. Um, yeah, and he's doing obviously awesome work as well. Um, good interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, thank you so much, Conrad, for coming on. Thank you, listeners, for enjoying. For we'll next next time, we'll just do an LLM of this where I will train an LLM on my speech and an LLM on your speech, and they'll speak to each other, and then we'll give it to the listeners. <laughs> Can't wait. Okay. Bye, everybody, and thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks and see you here for the next episode. Bye.